Welcome to the Super Expander Podcast. My name is Corrine Phelps, your host. I'm a business and growth coach, money mindset expert, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur. My journey has taken me all over from working in finance to owning a boutique fitness studio. I found myself burnt out, miserable and questioning everything, saying things to myself like, there's got to be more to life than this. Refusing to settle for a mediocre existence, I went all in, learning how to harness untapped potential and rewire the subconscious mind to create an extraordinary life. The last 10 years have been a crash course in self-love, building a business, creating community, building wealth, and doing what it takes to just freaking go for it. My mission is to help you align to your purpose, Rewire your subconscious to support your big dreams and vision and create a life that you're absolutely obsessed with. So sit back, tune in, and prepare to expand. Christiana Chaffee found blogging to be a creative and cathartic process through her long and winding journey in search of love. From there was born an unapologetic spinster. Prior to her biotech career, Christiana served as the captain in the U.S. Army for five years, including two years deployed in support of Operations Iraq Freedom. She holds a BS in management in the United States Military Academy at West Point and an MBA from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Her professional awards and recognitions include a Bronze Star, a Combat Action Badge, and a Medical Marketing and Media Award. She is a breast cancer survivor and an avid runner, a scuba diver enthusiast. Christiana resides in West Virginia with her geriatric cat, Ellie, and her rescue German Shepherd, Frankie. Hello, hello, my super expanders. I'm so excited for you to meet today's guest. I um we, we were just chatting a little bit before we hit hit record and I, I got to know some really cool things. And I know that this is gonna be such an amazing, juicy conversation. So buckle up and make sure, make sure that you can like really pay attention. So I don't know if you're like in the shower, if you're driving where you are, but like maybe turn up the volume and get ready for, for like a deep conversation. Like you're sitting at a table with your girlfriends. Like this is, this is going to be one of those ones. So I am so excited to share with you, Christiana Chaffee. Welcome to the podcast. So great to be here, Corey. Thank you for having me. Ah, uh, yes. So I always love to give a little bit of context of how we came to be sitting here. And uh, so I was at a party just recently for a good friend of mine, and I actually met Christiana's sister. And she was telling me about her sister and how she wrote this really, really cool book. And I was like, you know what? I need to meet your sister. I like, she sounds like a completely cool woman that I would want to be friends with. And here we are. Yes. And my identical twin sister. So now <laughs> you see, we definitely are identical. But. <laughs> oh, you know, I, that was a little tidbit of information I didn't actually know. And it was just, it's so funny because we, we get on here and I, we, this is the first time we're meeting guys. So like, this is, this is like, you get like a front row seat to like two people getting to know each other, like deeply, intimately over a podcast. But I instantly was like, oh, I already feel comfortable because I like, I already know you. <laughs> yes, that's, that's great. <laughs> So actually, so since we're talking about that there, like, tell me a little bit about being an identical twin. Oh, you know, it's, uh, it's not great as a kid. It's really not. Everybody thinks, oh, I wish I had an identical twin. You do when you're older, when you actually have your own identities and you've established who you are and where you want to go in life. But when you are a young kid and it's, you know, your brother or my brother had a name, but my sister and I were just the girls. Oh, so and so, and the girls. And you you learn that like maybe maybe I'm just a, a package deal. There, who am I? And you compound that. Actually, I went into the army. So my older brother, my twin sister, and I, all three of us, went to West Point, and we all joined the army. And so I, <laughs> I don't think I really figured out who I was until after I got out of the army, after I stopped wearing a uniform, and after I really figured out who I am as an individual versus being an identical twin, being mushed together with somebody, and then wearing a uniform and having to conform to a lot of rules and ways of being. So. Um, yeah, it's great being a twin now. I absolutely love it. She's my best friend. Her husband is my other best friend. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, but 
not so much as a kid. <laughs> oh, so you had to, had to go through a lot of stuff to get to the, the really fun part. Well, that just tees it right on up. So in on that journey, it brings us to today, which you get to share with us who you are deep down on a soul level. Yeah, who I am on a soul level. Well, you know what? I'm still figuring that out. I really am. And I think that who I am today is definitely not who I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's not who I'm going to be maybe a year from now, definitely not five years, 10 years from now. So I'm going to tell you who I think I am today. Uh, so at the core, I'm an evolving person. I believe, um, I believe I am learning. I'm a person who is learning to truly love, love myself love life, have an appreciation for life itself, not the things, the material things that we have, but the experiences that we can have. And those experiences come from interacting with other people, with nature, with animals, um, and just being, being one with the universe. So I believe at the core, I am a person grounded in deep love, that comes from the source of the universe, which I'm still exploring what exactly does that mean and what is that? But I mean, at the core, I like to think I'm love. Now, I'm also Italian from New York um, <laughs> and I am a Scorpio. So I'm also a very passionate, intense person with a whole lot of emotion. So coming from, from a place of love at my core is sometimes in contradiction to those other aspects of who I am. Um, and so do I always e emit a person? Like, does, is that who other people maybe sense a person of love? Maybe not. I think I'm also a very driven, um, capable, um, passionate person who has a lot of big dreams. But I, I like to think at this moment today, I come from a place of love in everything that I do. And sometimes I fail in how I execute on that. But that's, I guess that's my answer to that question. You guys, that's it. Podcast over. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I've never really thought about that, right? Because if, if you ask me, who am I at, at my core, as, as you ask all of your listeners, I mean, I, you, you list off a bunch of superficial things, right? Like I am this, that I am a marketer by day. I am, you know, I, I wrote, I'm an author on this stuff, these labels, but that's not who I really am. And deep meditation, I have found going into deep meditation and spending time with myself is where I'm starting to uncover the answer to that question, which is, <sighs> yeah. Yes, it is an ever evolving thing. I love that that's what you led with. And I love that as you kind of like wrap that description up, that it's like you're finding that and uncovering that through these different ways, uh, you know, like through through meditation and sitting with yourself and yes, life experiences. And I feel like the the piece too, talking about that there's these contradictions and that you're not always successful at this piece of you that who you are down at your core, because I think that's actually the human experience, right? Like the way that we see ourselves and perceive ourselves is kind of like how we want to show up in, in the world, but that is not, that's not always like perfect execution. There's a lot of things that are, I don't know, being thrown at us and throw like obstacles and testing testing us, right? That's the, that's the life experience. It's like an experiment that we're on this, this journey, this process. Absolutely. I actually, I've come to understand the law of attraction over the past few years. And, you know, my book is about modern dating and looking for love. And I just passed my 40th birthday. So I'm now, you know, middle-aged and still single with no, no um, main prospects on the horizon, but I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I think that's, be and I have every confidence I'm going to find that person for me and have everything I desire in this lifetime. But I've come to realize, you know, things get thrown at you. And how do you, how do you, how do you receive that? Do you take it as like a why me? Oh, this is awful. And create a snowball effect with all this negativity. Or do you say, Hey, you know what, this happened. I can't affect the fact that this happened, but is there learning in this? Is there growth in this? How do I take this lemon and make it lemonade? And 
over the past several years, I have actively every single day tried to take little setbacks, big life-changing setbacks and change the perspective. And to me, that's like the law of attraction is don't don't focus on the negativity, focus on the positivity, em, emit that in every way you can, and it will come back to you. And I feel like I'm I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that in the quality of the relationships I build. Um, I'm seeing that in my dreams of things I want to accomplish and things I want to do coming for me. Like they find me, This the, my day job. I mean, it came after having a terrible, terrible last, um, last corporate job. And I put out purposefully, I, I want and desire something more meaningful and rewarding. And it, it found me, it found me seven days of meditation and it found me and I couldn't be happier in my day job. So I, I believe anyway, I, you say that, and that's what makes me think it's like, it's life is about perspective. Um, it's about how you look at the things that happen ar around you, not like to you, you know, I don't want life to happen to me. I want to create the life that I dream about and those dreams change over time, but it's really fun to be able to try to um, to dream big and and work towards creating that and, and making it happen. Oh, so good. You definitely are speaking my language as I'm sitting here listening to you so many things. One, I'm just like thinking about, you know, a piece of, well, first I have to ask, seven days of meditation. I, want, I feel like I want to like guess. So are you a Dr. Joe Dispenza fan? I, I am. Yes. <laughs> so now we're really, we're gonna, you guys, this is going to be so fun. Cause I'm a huge Dr. <laughs> Joe Dispenza fan. I do a Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation every single day. So were you, is that what you were doing? So I, I want to say I am a fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza, but I am also, um, I was raised Catholic and, and, um, I've created a lot of superstitions as a result of that. So I'm actually still, I'm an atheist and I, um, I found that what Dr. Joe talks about and his practice resonates with me. So while I'm a fan of him, it's really his practice that I'm really a fan of, which is meditations with purpose. And it's not about him as an individual. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I think you probably totally understand what I'm talking about, but, um, just to, yeah, put yeah, that yeah. Out it's, there. it's the, it's the concepts and all of that. Also, I was raised Catholic. So there we go. Uh, here we are all of the parallel yeah. <laughs> parallels. So then I have to share this other piece before we, we go further. Um, so I was actually having, a, I was on a podcast interview, which probably if we, these things usually get dropped sequentially and it was earlier. So with Vanessa and Vanessa runs this, it's called the new shoe group. And what she said was that it, it was a description sort of, of source of energy of the universe and how she described it was truth. And it was actually the first time I've heard someone use language around it in that capacity. And it really landed for me. So I have to ask you and anybody who's listening, if they just listened to the last interview, it's just going to be like almost like a series. So we can kind of dive into that conversation a little bit here. I feel like this is kind of like fun. Yes, definitely. So, um, you know, so you asked me in those seven days, was I listening to uh, Dr. Joe meditation? Um, yes, I'm pretty sure looking back, it was about a year ago, I was, but I also take um, the concepts and I try to apply it in like as many waking moments as possible. So, and I think that's what he speaks to as well. It's um, you can spend 30 minutes, uh, an hour doing a deep meditation and really being in that moment and feeling balanced and feeling like your, um, your energy centers are aligned and you've got your, your emanating great love and vibration. But then if you, turn on the TV and watch some, you know, some news that upsets you. And then all of a sudden you're back to, you've, you've lost it. Right. So I've purposefully over the last few years, cut out the things that would outside of a, a meditation detract from my energy and my vibration. That includes people that includes, um, you know, outside communications or inputs into my life that, that are not productive for me. So during that period, I think I, I was so upset with what was happening in my current job at the time, but just like not good, 
not good people that I worked with, very negative energy that I would take the time to just shut everything down and say, I need 30 minutes right in the middle smack of my day. And I don't care if they fire me for it. I need 30 minutes right now because I'm not in a good place energetically. And if I want my future to be true, then I'm just going to sit here and be quiet with myself. And so I would practice like just letting negative thoughts just leave, leave me, leave out away from me and just breathe in and feel love and feel compassion for other people, feel compassion for these people. I really just could not stand. And that was a very hard thing to do. But I, that during that seven days, I remember the compassion I was trying to feel for people that I felt were very negative forces in, in my you know universe. So. Oh, yeah. So, so good. And it, it is true, right? It's almost, I, I love what you're talking about, like kind of not exposing yourself to things in that vein. You should know that I, I stopped watching television pretty much when I was 20. Uh, oh, wow. I gave it up. Yeah. I didn't like, I was like, this is not good for me. So I don't, I, I don't really pay attention to the news. And in my social media feed, when I get onto to Instagram, I think it's really funny if I was to show you my explore feed, it's only puppies. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you could throw some cats in there too. Cats are doing some funny things. Yeah. Too. <laughs> People are like, I, you know, it's so toxic. I'm like, I don't know. I actually, I get on Instagram and it makes me feel really good because the only thing I see are puppies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's there there really is something to cutting those things out of your life. I mean, I stopped watching the news several years ago and it doesn't matter in my opinion where you sit and what pol political um part of the spectrum or right in the middle, you're still there's just it's it's fear, it's fear-based entertainment and I don't think it does society any good and um and I yeah, and I stay away from it, which bring it maybe a little bit back on topic. I actually feel the same way about dating apps. I've been off dating apps for a year and a half now, and I don't miss it. And I have, you know, I'm still single and I have a lot of people saying, well, Christy, you've got to get out there. You've got to, you've got to get back on the dating apps. It's, you know, it's a numbers game and you've got to meet people that way. And I go, nope, I'm, I've been on a couple hundred in five years of being single. So I was in a 10 year relationship. It ended when I was 34. So from 34 to 39, I was on dating apps and I, I met only a couple people of meaningful connection. And I spent a lot of time, money, energy, um, in, in going through a hamster wheel groundhog day, right? Like it's groundhog day. And so, you know, I, that no longer served me and I'm going to meet my person, find my person in other ways. And, um, yeah, I think you've got to be very conscious about the energy that you have and how you choose to place that energy in, in your day and what you expect to get from that as a result of placing it in that place or with that person. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so true. Okay. So we, we bring up the idea of, of dating apps, which we're going to go there in, in a moment, but I want to actually talk about your, so all of this experience how it brought you to to write a book, right? So you've got the spirituality, this, you know, real deep understanding of the energy that you put out there, the the whole entire journey, right? So tell me a little bit about the book. So I'm excited to read it. So full transparency and and disclosure, I haven't had a chance to read it yet because this has all happened so quickly. This the magic that we're sitting here talking, I haven't actually had a chance to read the book yet. So I get to kind of like a preview as just, just as the guests are getting it here, listeners are getting it and we're all going to, maybe we should have like a book club and read it together, but tell me a little bit about how it came to be the idea, all of it. Yeah. So I do have a couple book clubs being lined up as well. So you're welcome to join that in a, in about a week. We got one, but um, so the book, started actually as a blog. I, um, this was maybe two years ago. I was on the back end of what I felt was a pretty deep heartbreak. Um, I thought at that time, after several years of dead end dating that I met the one I met this guy and he just felt right. It energetically felt like a match. He felt like when I was around him or with him, he felt like a partner. He, I remember thinking like, this is what I've been waiting for. The wait was worth it. But then 
he slipped through my fingers and it, it started all the fears, all the deep insecurities I had started to bubble up. And I got into this, you know, this non-productive mindset of, well, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm damaged. So I'm a, I'm a breast cancer survivor. I have I had an elective for double mastectomy and a reconstruction. So I got, went down the path of maybe physically I'm not attractive. Maybe um, I'm too old. Maybe I'm too successful as a woman in my career that a man doesn't want somebody who at 40 or almost 40 is this person. And I, everything, it doesn't matter if it was lo logical, rational or not. I started down that path and I realized this is not healthy for me. I'm not, I'm not going to be okay if I don't once and for all stop how I speak to myself, change the narrative in my mind. And it was almost as if hitting rock bottom with this final heartbreak um, where I thought maybe there was a light at the end of the tunnel and it just, the light went out. I said, I, I need to find a cathartic way to express myself. So as a very expressive person, um, and I clearly talk a lot, <laughs> and as a twin, I realized also you fight for attention with family, right? When at the dinner table, you got you to gotta talk. So I decided to write. And I found that when I was writing, I wanted to be purposeful in how I characterize these dating stories. So I didn't want to just be doomsday. This is, you know, terrible story after terrible story. I actually wanted to infuse humor and wit into my 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 little short story. So I created blogs that were in the in the early version of these blogs that soon became chapters as as a book later on, it was different perspective. How to take what one would say a terrible date and be like, "You know what?" There were there was some of that was kind of funny, and I'm appreciative of the fact that I had that experience because it's now made me think differently about this or that, and love myself a little bit more because I'm understanding myself more and I have more compassion for myself. So it started as a blog. Um, it then turned into a book because my blog readers, a very secret group of of um, friends, because I'm not too big on social media at the time, um, they loved it. And so I said, well, I'm a marketer and I've got these blogs that people are enjoy reading. I'm going to turn it into a book. And I started down that process of writing a book, but um, I, I then went through a phase of who am I to write a book around dating? I'm just a normal average person. Um, but I felt very creative and inspired at points during the journey. So there was a period where I didn't want to write and I thought this is a terrible idea. Uh, and then I, I got to the bottom of those insecurities and fears and said, no, I have a story to tell. And there's no book like this out there. All the books on dating advice, you know, are on dating is about bad advice, how to text a guy, how, how to be this for a guy, how to do that. So the guy will like you and fall in love with you. And I'm, that just became more reason for me to write my book because my book is about ultimately about loving yourself and putting yourself first and having the right perspective that even in the, the um, depths of despair in the dating world, you there's hope. Um, so I guess that's a lot to say. Um, I felt in some way that this cathartic expression of myself was meant to be shared with a greater audience and other people would be able to benefit from it. But I even say it in the book at the end, I wrote the book for me to, to get off my chest, the things and express myself to myself that at the end of the day, I really do love myself because I haven't always loved myself and writing this book and putting myself on the cover and my cats on the cover too. It's, I mean, it's humorous, right? To have call myself a spinster and have a picture of a cat on my, on my cover. And, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's been a journey in and of itself. And the book is about a journey. So that's how the book came to be. And uh, it's been a fun, fun project. Mm, it sounds like a, a fun project all, along the way. I also feel like the really enlightening piece about that too. And the, the, I think the fresh approach and take is the journey of dating is just actually a piece of getting to know yourself even more. And the, the thing that we're tasked with in that process is to just continue to like show up 
100% unapologetically yourself, right? So the whole idea of like, how do you write a text to get the thing you're like trying to grasp or clasp on to creating an outcome and no wonder so many things end in, I don't know, like these toxic relationships or end in divorce, if that was how it started was this way of like, how can I, how can I curate myself to show up? not as myself to get the outcome I want, but then the outcome you want is based on not being yourself. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Right. And I, I thought uh, when COVID happened and I had to wear a face mask, I was living in Boston at the time and I would go on dates wearing athleisure clothing with a face mask. I didn't have to, I put maybe some mascara on, but I didn't put makeup on. I stopped doing my hair. I stopped putting like putting my best face forward quite literally. And I just went out and I was myself. And I realized there was no difference in whether or not a guy wanted a second date. The rate of me getting a second date was the same during COVID with me putting in no effort to my physical appearance as it was previous when I got all dolled up. And I learned that it's not about um, who, it's just about being yourself and being confident in that person. And when you're on a date, just making that other person feel like they matter. That the time you you may not ever go on another date with them you may never talk to them again but you are there and you're present and you're confident with who you are and that will go way further than what your outfit looks like how much makeup you have on or you name it great <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you. Have you joined the Super Expander free mentorship community? If not, what are you waiting for? Stop what you're doing right now and text the word mentor to 202-918-3235. Text the word mentor to 202-918-3235. I send out weekly tips and inspiration to help you grow your business, to step into your wealthiest, most highest self, to harness your full potential and live an exceptional and extraordinary life. And the best part is it's really me sending those messages. So text me, say hello, and send me your questions. All right. So I got, I I have to ask because before we hit record, we were having this, this conversation about dating and there being this counterculture that's there. So I am really curious to hear your thoughts on this and for you to expand on what you, what you think about this. Yeah. So I believe that society is ripe for counterculture in dating. Um, you know, the pendulums in so many different areas of life and society, they swing from one side to another, to another. Right now, we're in an environment where people date and they date only on apps. You go to a bar, most single people at a bar are not going to be looking to see if there's other single people in the same physical room with them. They're going to rely on their dating app and what they see is a physical picture and some short little blurb or answering a couple questions to match and find their soulmate. So we've created this artificial technological construct for dating that never existed 20 years ago. And it is so ingrained in how we operate as humans, being on our phones all the time, being so tapped into technology that we lose the opportunity to actually meet people organically. And I, I have always thought, um, and it's an, it, we won't get to it today, I don't think, but, you know, I, I believe that dating on a dating app is just re, recreating the spontaneous meet up in aisle seven of the grocery store. So back when you used to just go to pick, buy, get a can of soup in aisle seven and you, you reach for a can of soup and a, a gentleman or whomever, whatever, you know, whoever you're interested in reaches and grabs the same can of soup and your eyes meet and you're like, oh, wow, like you're handsome and you're a great look, whatever. And you start a conversation. There's a spark. The point is there's a spark and you've just happened to bump into them wearing, you know, your leggings or what, what have you looking a hot mess. But the point is you were just living life and you met somebody and you had a spark and you went with it. And we don't do that. We now rely on an app to recreate this organic interaction. And it's so forced. 
I think it's forced for many people because they're trying so hard and they're like, maybe this will be the last date I go on. And I think the point is with the counterculture, stop trying so hard, stop trying to impress other people, stop worrying about how many times you go on a date this week based off of an app, just start living your life live your life being true to who you are, you know, and going back to Joe Dispenza and meditations and vibration, just be your best self and let that positivity, that energy you're putting out come back to you. And the final thought around that is, um, you know, I'm not worried never being, I'm never going on a date again, on a, on a dating app date again, I should say, I'm going to go on many dates. It's over. Time, I'm sure, but <laughs> it's over. No, I'm never going to, I'm never going to go on a dating app again because my energy is not what I want it to be when I feel within this forced technological construct. So I'm focusing on living my life to the max outside in every which way that I can and allow the universe to bring to me whoever is right for me in at whatever time and be at peace with that versus I'm 40, my, you know, I got another two years before I can have kids or whatever, you know, thoughts might be going through my mind. Just let it be and be myself, that evolving person at the core and, and allow life and opportunity to come my way. Yeah, that's so good. So all of what you're saying truly resonates with me. So I, I don't know, like maybe like five, I, I have not done a whole lot on dating apps, but I did spend a summer doing it. Right. And I actually feel like a like few dates in, I actually was like, this is ridiculous, but my clients were loving the stories that I was telling. And I was like, I actually feel like this is good for my business. And I just like kept it up for the, for the whole summer, because I would just cut back with these stories for my Pilates classes. When I was teaching them, these women were like, tell me more, what happened, what happened, what happened. But my observation was I kind of similar to what you were talking about. And I, what I thought was, it's really interesting how when you look at someone's profile, it's like, A, I think that you either conform to show up as some sort of way or they do. So you, I think it starts to make you a little bit of like a um, untrusting, skeptical kind of person. And in that, we actually start to turn off, I think, our intuitive, there's this intuitive piece when you meet someone initially, there's this feeling, this gut feeling that you're like, ooh, whether we are going to call that a spark or just you're like, oh, I would like... I'm open to this kind of thing. And so when you're talking to someone online and you have multiple like conversations going back via text or whatever inside of an app, you break that down. And so there's this like layer of comfort with that person before you meet them, but you don't know them at all. And so your intuitive gut, like feeling, it's not there when you meet them, it's turned off. Yes. So I actually have a chapter in my book where I refer to this uh, slow burn experiment where I, I feel when I meet somebody in a romantic setting where I'm thinking like this might be a romantic partner, I feel... Um, I feel something usually I feel either what is what feels like attraction to me that's like a magnet and a, a magnetic energetic attraction and it's positive and they feel familiar to me or I actually feel repulsed by them and that's not like oh they're there it's based on their looks it's actually it's an energetic thing because I felt repulsion from very I remember one gentleman extremely good looking and I felt this very strong repulsion from him and I was like, I can't explain that. I just know without, you know, even having five minutes for a drink that I'm never going on a date with this, this gentleman again, because I, I just don't feel the familiarity. I want, I want to feel like, um, if you're tapping into your intuition, I want to feel that there's somebody on a soul level that I'm supposed to be connected with. And when I started to pay attention to that first few seconds of how do I feel around a person in that romantic setting, I don't believe I've been wrong yet. I don't believe that I've missed out on somebody that um, I was supposed to have a, you know, I was supposed to get married to this person, but I said, oh, I don't feel a connection to them. Um, I don't think that's the case. And I actually write about that in my book a little bit, but I think you're, you're speaking to why we shouldn't spend so much time on 
texting somebody before we even met them in person. Yeah, well, it's just the whole thing. I think that you don't, you look at an app, you see this thing, it's very impersonal, it's a curated thing. And people are either like, even their profile, it's either curated to be like, you know, the highlight reel, or it's like, so blase, because they don't want to look like they put their, like, they're actually want something. I'm going to be like the cool person who's just like, hey, I'm here. So I'm not going to put, I'm going to be with this like cryptic kind of amount of effort into, you know, crafting a profile. I think there are like many gambits of it, but I found the whole entire thing excruciating the summer that I did it. And I, I don't know, it was just like the weirdest ride. And I can't, I don't, I, I'm blown away that people actually find true connections through I mean I know that they do there's millions of people out there that have met and been married through through apps but I feel like it's it's almost like a it's it's a wonder that that happens yes I see that's how I feel as well and um, I think people are trying to be as you're speaking to something somebody that somebody else wants they're trying to they're it's so forced it's like I I, I need to get off this dating app, be the person, be the person, be the reason I get off the dating app. That was something I used to see all the time. And I'd be like, that's funny, but we're going to meet. And then I'm going to wonder, are you so desperate to get off the dating app that you're just going to believe me to be the one for you, you know, and it, it shouldn't feel forced. It should feel if you're really looking for a lifetime partner, uh, it should feel very natural and technology. I don't think in this respect does us any favors and does society any favors. Um, I think it, it creates, um, a lot of negativity and, um, people, I think women, especially, uh, just from my girlfriends that I know, they, they, they don't have the most positive experiences from dating apps as a whole. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. Okay. So we could probably like riff on this all day long, but I got to ask, I got to go in and ask along the way, you know, you wrote this book, you, you brought it out, which I feel like in a lot of ways is had to have been this like a little scary in a way. It's like a vulnerable topic, a vulnerable conversation, a deep share on all of it. So there had to have been someone, a super expander for you, someone who pushed you, sh showed you that, you know, this, this was possible that you were meant for this. I'd love to hear, I love to hear a super expander story. So um, my super expander, the one that comes to mind, did this was way before I even thought about writing a book, um, but it was a, it was in this journey of in the last five years. I was at my absolute lowest point from a mental health space. So I had been diagnosed with breast cancer, elected for an aggressive surgery, and I was living in Boston. And I found, you know, I was still experiencing heartbreak and lack of connection with individuals, which was creating, you know, a sad place for me. Top, top that with having just had my physical body changed and the fears of, um, you know, cancer coming back one day, a whole lot of stuff. And then add on top of that, I wasn't making like friendships connections in Boston. I, I was still fairly new to that city and it was very tough for me. Um, and I hit rock bottom. I mean, I was clinically depressed. I was really, really in a, in a bad space mentally. And I think most people probably wouldn't have known because I was a high functioning depressive, but I was clinically depressed. And I sought out professional help from a therapist who um, in some ways like saved my life because he he took the time and he was a great therapist for me, understood me at a certain level and gave me tools in my toolkit, many tools to help me um, be kinder with myself and um, find a way out of it. And one of the first things he said with me, which will probably stay with me for the rest of my life, you know, when I was going through all this doomsday stuff and now I, and I have breast cancer and, you know, all this stuff. And he says, how about we do this? How about we together set a goal that through this work, we're going to find a way to take this devastating experience, this, you know, um, this diagnosis that and turn it into a superpower for you. And I just remember looking at him and saying, that's crazy. Like, how could cancer be something I turn into a superpower? And how can that make me super, superhuman? And um I think in hindsight, I've come to realize that what he was really saying is what we talked about in the beginning, how did, how your perspective is everything in life. And it is, it affects you at your, at your core and it affects how your life plays out and whether 
good things keep happening to you or bad things keep happening to you, sometimes it's, sometimes it's, I believe it's a result of your perspective on life. And while bad things may and will always continue to happen to me, you know, in some ways, I'm going to look at it as an opportunity to find strength and growth and push myself forward. So, so my book is an extension of me saying, I am so proud of who I am as a human and the person that I am striving to be in my life that I, I wanted to write it down and express it and other people liked it. So it just kind of evolved. And, um, so yeah, it's, um, my therapist, maybe that's not the answer I'm supposed to give, but my therapist was, uh, a huge proponent of, of me loving myself. And my book is about me loving myself. Uh, there is no right answer. Everyone's super expander story is, is theirs. Right. And I, I love that. Uh, and I feel like it's a, for anybody listening that maybe n- needs and wants to seek out support from a therapist that just in and of itself is an inspiration to make the leap to get the support because look what it has done for you and how like where you are today it's outside of just like feeling better now you have this really cool book that is out there in the world that's an expression of you and who you are and it's helping people and we're here having this conversation and all the cool things that you're doing in in the world so yeah I think that that's pretty pretty cool so all right I know everyone now is listening they're like so curious they want they want their hands on this book and they want to get in your world. So tell me and tell the audience how it is that they can find you, how they can get into your world. What's the best way? Well, so my book is called An Unapologetic Spinster, True Modern Dating Stories. You can find me on Amazon. I'm still technically pre-publication date, so pre-release date. So I'm the only person who can actually give you my book ahead of that uh, release date, which is about a month and a half out. So find me on Amazon. Make sure you select my storefront. I ship it out right to you. Um, Or you can visit my website, website, unapologeticspinster.com. And that's where I can send signed copies if any anybody would love one, I'd love to sign it and send it to you and make it personal because it's a personal story. Um, I'm also on Instagram at unapologetic underscore spinster and uh, planning a few fun things on that social media site, but um, you know, just being me and expressing myself. So Amazon, my website, unapologeticspinster.com or Instagram. Amazing. All of that will of course be in the show notes. So make sure you go follow, buy the book. What's the, so we should talk about this. What's the launch date? Because that's a big piece too. Like, a, do, you, do I have to ask, do you have like a launch team? Uh, so I, so my launch date is March 7th, but my ebook, so I've done, I'm a marketer, right. And I am impatient and I have a full-time job and I didn't want to wait until March 7th and do this whole big normal traditional thing. I'm not a traditional person. So I actually found and educated myself in my spare time, uh, launching my book on Amazon as an ebook that happened in October. And I have set up a storefront on Amazon for the print print book. So I actually have, I mean, it's a hybrid model. So I've created, it's my vision, bringing it to life. And I've carved out the areas that I want control over, which includes um, a lot of the distribution and selling portion, because, you, you know, it's it's tough as an author, I think, to break even. And I'm a businesswoman at heart. So I'm trying to find the ways that I can control things. Um, so I do have a PR and comms team. So I will be doing some TV, radio podcasts as well in the future. Um, but for now, it's mostly mostly on my front that I've been creating noise and doing things. Okay. Okay. Love that. And I mean, geez, learning how to to do all these things in your spare time, right? At writing a book, having a full-time job, learning how to market your book and get it out there so that it has visibility and it gets in the hands of the people that need to read it. Jeez, I am impressed. Okay. So you guys got to make sure you go down and follow, say hi, order the book or put your pre-order in so that you can get it when it drops. 
and make sure you let her know that you heard about her here on, on the Super Expander podcast and let her know like what your favorite part is. Cause I feel like that's kind of fun for people to know, like what really hit home, what resonated. Okay. So this is how we, we like to wrap it up in a tight little bow. If you had one just kind of nugget of wisdom, some parting words, what would they be? I say this in my book and I believe it. And it's been a guiding force for me. And it actually came out of a meditation. Um, my advice would be the love we all so desperately seek is already within us. Mm, I love that. I feel like you guys got to listen to that one more time. Say that one more time. So there you are. Yeah. The, the love we all so desperately seek is already within us. Oh, I feel that. So good. Oh. Thank you so, so much for being here, for sharing your story, for pouring yourself into that book that I cannot wait to read, The Unapologetic Spinster. I am literally on the edge of my seat waiting to to receive that. So thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Yes. We'll catch you on the next episode. If you like what you heard, stop, drop, and leave a five-star review and hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. As always, the best way that you can thank our amazing guests is to share your biggest takeaway and then tag us on social media. 